Hey, everybody. Hey, I, you spoke first. That's new. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining. If you joined early, if you're watching this in the archives, then thank you very much. Uh, this is Space Club, where we talk about the last month in planetary science. Uh, my name's Dana Bednar. I'm a part-time assistant professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Western University. I have an I-5 at the Canadian Space Agency, and I'm very warm. It's uh, 35 out here today. The air conditioner is working, but not necessarily in this room. And I'm surrounded by screens, and I'm also somehow in the dark because uh, the screens wash out my face. So that's me. Um, so joining me is Professor Emeritus from the same Department of Geography and the Environment at Western University, Phil Stuk, author of many Hello. books, knower of many space things, all around good person. Yeah. Phil, thank you for being here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Glad, glad to be here. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I should say. Glad to be here. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, and Dr. Tanya Harrison, uh, doer of Twitter, director of space operations, science operations at, at, at the planet, Martian Guru. Yeah, definitely not space operations. <laughs> yeah. Is that a thing? Uh, yeah, we have a guy that does that. So sorry, okay, James. So you're not that guy. No, you're science. No. You're science. Um, and uh, uh, Martian guru, or is she? We'll get to that. Um, Ooh. Uh, yeah, I have, I have something. But uh, first thing I wanted to talk about, is some of you may know, Tanya and I are working on another project, a second book. This one is going to be uh, Mars. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but one of the conversations we had uh, over the last month and kind of ties into everything that's been happening uh, the last month as well, is this idea of audiences as, as people who are putting together space content. Uh, I think Tanya thinks about this a lot. I've thought about this and I wanted to ask Phil about this mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, and the main thing we were talking about is kind of space audiences and interests across different generations. So bear with right. me. I want to lay something out. I've always had it in my head is more of just kind of a conceptual way of thinking of, of space. Um, and I, I want to see what you think and then also kind of ask you about, because you taught space exploration for a long time at the university level. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this. But, you know, I, I was saying to Tanya, I think of space exploration and kind of three audiences vaguely broken down by generational lines. So we have kind of the boomers and the space race, which kind of align. You have the space race 57, Sputnik to roughly 77. It's it, I go 20 year chunks, which isn't perfect, but 77 works for the first early test shuttle missions. Uh, and, and that's kind of my second era, but this first era, kind of the space race slash Apollo era of, of people who were interested in space. And that lines up with kind of the boomer, uh, 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 baby boomer generation. The second one, the Gen Y uh, aligns mostly with the shuttle. Another 20 year chunk I've always kind of thought of 77 and 97. Now I know the shuttle goes much longer, another uh, 14 years. Uh, but, you know, the shuttle was obviously the big thing in the 80s. Gen Y is the MTV generation. And 97 is, again, another nice, like, early version of what I think is the next big one. And that's millennials and rovers. Uh, I always think of us as kind of the generation that came up on Mars rovers. 97 was the first one. So, um, and another 20-year chunk. This one doesn't work as well because 2017 isn't really a capstone year for rovers. You have kind of the last full year of um, opportunities operation, but not much beyond that. And then what Tanya and I were talking about is, okay, if, if you buy into that, or even if you don't, but obviously things are changing, what are kids into today with space? What are they being introduced to? And by kids, we mean just younger people than we are. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of the audiences for space exploration and also what you saw in your years teaching. Oh, well, okay. This, uh, that's quite a complicated question. So, <laughs> I'm a complicated thinker. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, I don't know. Well, let's think about uh, uh, t today for a minute. Um, I think uh, maybe the thing that's different about today uh, is the advent of... Uh, of commercialization, uh, um, that's not really a very good way to look at it, but um, uh, uh, the um, uh, the big sort of 
private companies that are uh, getting into into things um they there have always been private companies or, co or companies sort of involved in uh, in spaces contractors but always contracts contractors to nasa but now uh, we have more and more uh, companies doing things for themselves and spacex is the obvious example so i think uh, youngsters today are growing up seeing things like uh, rockets landing which say which has never been seen before basically uh, and uh, and th thinking about uh, um, fairly soon we'll be seeing uh, the private companies in the clips program uh, uh, landing on the moon and they're carrying science instruments but they're carrying a lot of other stuff as well which is going to involve direct uh, engagement in what in what's happening um, with things like uh, you know, like one company that is uh, is sending uh, a couple of rovers that will then do a, a race on the moon uh that's the idea anyway we'll see how it works but uh you know this sort of uh, much more direct uh engagement and because people uh can watch all this stuff on their phones or other other uh, media like that but they're very immediately uh they're going to be much more engaged in what's happening uh in that sense uh so um uh, i i think uh that kind of makes a, uh makes a a difference and it's certainly different from uh, the earlier phases you were talking about, because I can uh, I can go all the way back into the Apollo period and uh, uh, through the er, the seventies to the Viking landings in seventy six, all of which falls into your first period there. Uh, but there, um, you might get to see something on the news briefly if it happens to be a major news item, and it, definitely the first moon landing was. But the later moon landings were definitely relegated to kind of pushed back into the end of the news program or to the uh, middle pages of the newspaper or something like that. Uh, you know, it was it uh, it was not so immediate um, uh, once you get away from the special thing of Apollo eleven. Uh, so it was not so immediate, uh, and basically people had to. Uh, uh had to wait uh, a few weeks for the big news magazines to to put out articles and a few months for the space magazines like sky and telescope to put out articles and uh, it just took so much longer and there's so much less uh, uh, immediacy to that engagement so that's something that's really changed o over that period of time and to uh, right now you know people are seeing let's face it you there there are rocket launches like sometimes Two a week it's happening so there's so much of it going on uh and uh um it, it, it's a it's a very different world in that sense that's an interesting observation like mentioning the later apollo missions kind of getting pushed back because i think those of us that are interested in space kind of have this idea in mind that things were really fast paced during apollo because you had so many missions going on there's always something happening for that chunk of time compared to maybe shifting into the sort of after the first couple of years of the space shuttle when things were pretty slow you know it wasn't launching nearly as often as they were hoping it was going to be right. you didn't have a lot of space missions going on otherwise right. you know voyager was doing its thing but it's a really long transit time between each of its encounters with the different planets mm -hmm. But it sounds like that wasn't really the case. It, it that that fast pace wasn't actually there in terms of keeping the attention of the public compared to what we see now. With certainly the things for the Apollo program weren't happening as fast as like SpaceX's Starlink launches. Right. But um, even though you had a lot of things happening in Apollo, it sounds like it, it still wasn't capturing the attention of folks once you got past the first mission. Uh, yeah, I really think that uh, that's true. Um, I mean, you know, some of it is just sort of the unfortunate way that things worked out. Apollo 11 was a big thing because it was absolutely the first time ever. So everybody was looking at it. Uh, but with Apollo 12, they lost their TV camera about uh, half an hour into the EVA. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> uh, and even if they hadn't, most of the time they would have been out of range of it. And for Apollo 14, that was certainly true that uh, uh, although they kept the TV camera, most of the time they were out of range of it. Uh, and so it was it was less of a, an enticing media event. Uh, and only it, when we get into the later missions uh, with the rovers and there's a TV camera on the rover. So there's always TV coverage of what's happening. Um, uh, the problem is that by then a lot of people had kind of lost interest because uh, after the first mission, things hadn't been so exciting. Um, and also because people, unless you're really a space enthusiast, other people are just sort of there because it's exciting and new, and then they move on to something else. So uh, you know the the level of interest didn't didn't stay. 
uh, and uh, yeah, you, you you really had to search to find um, a little bit of news coverage uh, uh, for the later Apollo missions, and then wait wait some period of time until it started showing up in the um, you know a few days for the newspapers and a few weeks for the news magazines and a few months for the the big space magazines and so on. You had to but you had to wait. When these things happen in the future, when people go back to the moon, as they presumably will in the not too distant future, it will be so immediate. You'll be watching an EVA on your phone during your lunch break, as I so a little simile I always like to give. It'll be totally immediate. People who want it will have it right away. Yeah, and so this is what fascinates, and I think about this a lot, and I think Tanya and I have talked about this as well. Like I'm rel like the thing about it is certainly much more immediate and it's also it's 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 amplified for the people who are out to seek it and we see them on twitter and there's kind of a twitter space community and what always mm -hmm. fascinates me is what about everyone else and like <laughs> what about people who aren't vaguely interested in space and not only will the immediacy bring it to them but it'll also bring other things and i just wonder like the news cycle so quick and and we might think someone going to mars or, or the moon seems big but i i am really really interested and part of me is really skeptical about what that moment might look like from a pop cult from a pop culture perspective um yeah I, I just i guess we'll only know when it happens um but this is something we should talk about um maybe in, in next month as well uh, and keep the thread going but uh we do have to move on because uh, we have a lot to cover today yeah um <laughs> yeah thanks guys um where am i yep space on this day this week whatever works for whatever i find that's interesting um i'm still mad about last week when i was mess last month when i was messing up uh the, the moon missions <laughs> and what i learned <laughs> is yeah. is use big notes i was using the small powerpoint notes and uh also don't make notes for things you vaguely already remember i probably would have been better off to just uh, go off my memory um but anyways what i found for this tomorrow in space is uh, uh cassini's birthday 396th birthday of giovanni cassini i didn't know that was his first name i probably could have guessed either giovanni or giuseppe for the old astronomers um <laughs> Most famous, of course, because we named the Cassini spacecraft after him, right, Phil? Uh, that's right. There you go. <laughs> uh, let me let me uh, add a little something about his first name, by the way. Okay. Uh, he was an Italian, and his name yeah. was Giovanni Domenico Cassini. But he moved to France, and there he called himself Jean Dominique Cassini. So oh. he put his name in both versions. So okay, yeah, because Giuseppe is like Joe, as far as I'm aware. Because <laughs> there's an old joke that Giuseppe Verdi is Joe Green. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he also, he found four of, the, four of the major Saturnian moons. Well, not the biggest one. That was probably already well known. Uh, but he found Iapetus, Tethys, Dion, and uh, one other. This is the problem with small notes once again. Uh, and the ring gap. Yeah, the ring gap. Uh, so the rings aren't... A Literal right? yeah yeah um anyways. so you know some things that aren't about mars <laughs> raya raya is the fourth one so he found those moons good for him uh cassini probe 97 to 7 2017 when it crashed uh into saturn in a blaze of glory that we all wish we could have when we go out uh it was planned we didn't want that spacecraft by we i mean humanity uh we didn't want that spacecraft crashing into any of the icy potentially, well, liquidy moons around Saturn and any risk of, of contamination. So way to go, Giovanni, John, Gio. Uh, happy birthday tomorrow. Let's move on. I mentioned Tanya of Mars. Um, I, I caught you on international <laughs> television with another planet. I, I cheated oh. on Mars. I'm <laughs> sorry. Timing. So first of all, well done. Second of all, how dare you? Um, <laughs> it was for thing, Paul Byrne. If he's watching, uh, you know, I had to give Venus its day. Okay. okay. <laughs> Venus is having lots of days this week and, and will later here. Um, but a few issues. One, no 
for all humankind behind you. <laughs> so this is, it should have looked something like this, like. <laughs> Shoot, missed opportunity. Uh, two, I'm gonna mail you a picture Papa's of me. Papa's watching right now, sorry. <laughs> Awesome. I'm going to mail you a picture of me framed that you can also put behind you. Um, but you have to be holding Meoward. So sure. you're Meoward I'll be holding the book the and Meoward. Uh, <laughs> and, and the three, you didn't pitch Space Club. You could have said, learn way more about this from Dr. Phil Stook and, and Danny uh, <laughs> on, on YouTube. Um, but otherwise, way to go next time this isn't even national news this is like Al Jazeera is one of the biggest news organizations on the planet international television and you don't even hawk our book um, I mean to be fair they called me with like 20 minutes notice at 11 o'clock at night and I was like I was in my pajamas and like you know not camera ready at all it's like can you talk about Venus in 20 minutes I'm like oh crap okay put my are makeup those, back on comb my hair <laughs> are those your pajamas those are not my pajamas. I okay. put actual clothes on to do the interview, but you can see, like, if you see the white pillows behind yes. me, like I was sleeping on my couch. And so I had to like, just try to kind of hide stuff because they wouldn't let me even use a virtual background. I'm like, oh, you guys, come on. <laughs> but it was great. I'm, I'm like honored that they just yeah, like, want me to huge. talk about space. So it, it's pretty surreal. <laughs> Sorry, I froze it on an unflattering moment. Oh, it keeps freezing. We're really taxing the internet here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's because I have to. So I need three screens to do this, and I only have two, uh, and it creates endless issues. But um, okay, so way to go, Tanya. But next time, get us some money. Um, <laughs> so, Phil, I, we'll do this quickly because one, it's silly, and I know you love silly questions. And two, we have a ton to get to. But last week, uh, the astronomers online were excited for astronomy reasons to go take astronomy pictures of Mercury and Venus, which were close together. And this got me thinking about if Mercury and Venus collided in real life. Now, Phil, you're, you pay attention to kind of the mythological framework of a lot of the naming conventions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You, seem to, you seem to know. So in a fight, uh, Venus versus Mercury. You can either go the Roman gods they're named after, so if the Roman god Venus fought yes. Mercury, or the planets, assuming they were sentient creatures, if they got in a fight, who would win mm. in your Professor Emeritus? You're making some mighty big assumptions here about these planets. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would favor Venus, personally, uh, in, in any uh, collision there. Uh, Yes, I, I, I think that's fair. If you want to look at the planets, it's the it's the size. And if you want to look at the deities, uh, well, I think uh, Aphrodite or Venus would uh, be able to um, uh, probably uh, confuse Mercury. And, and uh, <laughs> that's a polite way of putting it. And, um, oh, I see. Uh, and somehow prevail. Seduce him, right. So I looked into this a little bit. Tanya, I don't know if you have thoughts. We This is... This is what I want NASA actually studying. But um, so in terms of the Roman gods, like Mercury, god of speed, as far as I'm aware, at least that's what I've learned from comic books. Venus, god of love, but I also, god of victory. Goddess. Which is goddess of victory. My apologies to Venus, um, which makes it a bit unfair. Obviously, if the planets were to fight, Venus would win, although Mercury has density on its side, second most dense planet in our solar system. So a good defensive posture, but not much in offense. Tanya, do you have thoughts before we move on? I mean, I agree Venus would win. I think the uh, the temperature on the surface alone makes it a formidable competitor compared to Mercury. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Actually, across the solar system, Venus would probably... Well, it's small, though. Anyways, speaking of segues, speaking <laughs> of Vega, <laughs> Venus, um, big, big news. Enhance. Um, we're, we're, there are two new Venus missions coming up. Apparently, we have several Venus experts uh, online watching. So, both of you better be careful. I'm not going to say anything. Um, <laughs> You've already said too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, obviously, these missions are being designed to build off the great legacy of the great, glorious Venera landers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s from the Soviet Union. Uh, Tanya, you were on international television talking about uh, both Veritas and Da Vinci Plus. What do we know about these new missions that are uh, 
going to launch roughly 2029. Uh, so first, don't ask me what the acronyms stand for because I had to read them off a screen when I was doing the interview because I couldn't remember each of them. They're very convoluted, you know, in the tradition of NASA acronyms. But basically, uh, we have one mission that is designed to be kind of like a traditional orbiter mission that's going to teach us about Venus uh, like a normal satellite. But then we have another mission that's actually going to send a, a, essentially a probe through the atmosphere so we can actually take photos of the surface, which we can't do from space without something like radar like we had with Magellan, for example, because you can't see through that thick atmosphere of Venus. And so... Um, from what I can tell, it sounds very similar to the Huygens probe that we sent to Titan back with the Cassini mission. So throw back to good old Giovanni here. Uh, once you get underneath that cloud deck, you can actually start taking photographs of the surface. So that'll give us something new. We'll finally have something more than just those pictures on the surface from Venera in those few minutes before they melted thanks to the temperatures and pressures on the surface there. So we'll learn a lot about whether maybe Venus is still volcanically active or not. This was, uh, we thought Venus was dead until Venus Express, and, and now maybe there's some questions there. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, what we learn from these two missions. I'm really excited, personally. You know, I as a Martian, I love that Mars has had so many missions and we have so much data there, but the rest of the solar system is really cool, too, and I would love to see other planets, and especially moons in the outer solar system, get their day. So I am I'm so happy for the Venus community that they're getting not one, but two missions that are very different from each other to get this nice complementary data set. You know, we've neglected our sometimes nearest neighbor far too often, like over the last couple of decades. So, you know, let's give Venus some love. Let's get some data for some other planetary scientists out there. And, you know, we can survive uh, on Mars with the data that we've got to do some more analyses for quite a long time, thanks to all the missions we have. Yeah, great. I took it down because I accidentally deleted the video we had of Venus because I when I plugged in Phil's slides. So Phil, kill some time. <laughs> Which mission well, are you ex more excited about, uh, Da Vinci Plus or Veritas? Ooh, I don't want to choose between them. They're, they're so <laughs> different. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be great to have that descent imaging. We've never had that before uh, at Venus. It'll be really cool. And it will help to bridge that uh, resolution gap between the uh, the surface images and the uh, and the orbital, uh, so that's that, you know that's great. It's going to be really good. Um, but uh, well, also you know, I mean, we have nice maps of Venus now, but they really don't stand up in comparison very well to what we have for the Moon and Mars. Uh, and uh, especially, although we have nice imaging from Magellan, the the topography is really not great. Uh, and it will be so cool to have a really high resolution and very high quality uh, topographic data set. Uh, that will make a big difference. So we've got Tanya, a question. I, oh, I, sorry. Oh, I fixed it. You can throw it back on. OK. Uh, before that, uh, I just want to get to this question from the audience from Sun Devil Advocate. Uh, I think the answer here, how is the probe going to avoid having its electronics fried? I think it's designed to be a very short lifetime. You know we know that it won't survive long based on what happened to Venera. And so it will collect images on the way down and then probably, I assume they know it's going to be fried very quickly once it lands on the surface. So we're only going to get images over one specific part of Venus. Uh, I forget which uh, Regio it is that they're going to, they're yeah, planning alpha, on coming down. Alpha, alpha Regio. I think. Alpha, okay. Yeah, that yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah, so unfortunately it won't be a long-lived probe, but it'll get us some really fantastic information that we didn't have before. And we'll learn about the atmosphere of Venus as it's coming down as well. So yeah, and it's worth pointing out that we can do so much more now uh, than we could before in a short time. Uh, you know, uh, every uh, an enormous amount of information will be collected in a short time, uh, much more than you could have done 30 or 40 years ago in the same time period. But will they sample a lens cap? <laughs> I'm sure they'll try. <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, um, that was like a, this is like a movie trailer right here. Uh, did you see this? No, just the bit that played right here. Okay, so under or over this is like Hans Zimmer style, like wow, toxic Ooh. atmosphere in the world. And it, it's really a movie trailer. Um, at times it's a bit much, but it's overall nicely well done. Um, 
and then I watched the press conference as well, which was really good. So, yeah, really good announcement. Obviously, exciting to see Venus stuff. Uh, a couple things I noted from the media around this. One, no real connection to the phosphine not finding, maybe finding. I think there's people in the audience who might know more about that. Um, so there's no real connection to that. And I saw some discussion online that that was not a factor in, in selecting these missions as far as they knew, uh, but that maybe other people know more. But what I also saw and what I liked was direct references to the role that comparative science at Venus could play in regards to climate change on Earth, which I liked. Um, and then kind of surprising to me, but maybe more so because I don't really pay attention to the exoplanet stuff. A lot of discussions in kind of using comparative science at Venus to help constrain exoplanet science, which was also mm. something that I wasn't really expecting. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I'm glad to see, you know, this is something that those of us in the environmental science community, but who are also really interested in space exploration have been saying for a while is like this, and Phil, you've said this a lot too, is like the direct comparative potential of other planets, which we obviously can't do on Earth, uh, it is right there. And Venus is probably the best example of that. So that was cool to see in the press. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Anything else on well, those? Anyone in the? I can't see the screen now. So anyone in the uh, comments saying anything there, Tanya? Uh, nope, no more questions. I think we're good. Okay. Whenever there's a new mission, I like to think of my own acronym for it. I couldn't think of one for Da Vinci, but for Veritas, <laughs> I had Venetian Exploration Robot and Interplanetary Traveler Acting Sciency. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I encourage others to make up your own acronyms for missions. It's fun. Uh. Other thing that caught my eye this month, and uh, Tanya, I think I know it caught yours as well because you retweeted a thread that went through it, but a paper that got published this last month uh, on something that you've told me about in the past, I think when I've had you into my classroom to talk about Mars as well, uh, or on, on the class podcast, this idea that, okay, if there were giant oceans across Mars or, or planet-wide oceans, even now, a few hundred million years later, we should be able to see some shorelines or evidence of shorelines of these features. Uh, a new paper came out this month talking about this. Uh, Tanya, what, what's the paper have to add? Yeah, so I'm sure most people, whenever you've seen these artist renditions of what Mars used to look like, you usually see something like this picture here where there's this vast Northern Hemisphere ocean, but there actually hasn't been much evidence that that ocean was ever there. Uh, we've looked for evidence of shorelines with things like the Mars Orbiter camera on Mars Global Surveyor, all along that dichotomy boundary between the Northern and Southern hemispheres and didn't really find strong evidence for it. And now we have super high resolution imaging with things like high rise at a postage stamp scale and the context camera or CTX on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter taking like higher resolution images over the entire planet. And so this paper does a really good job of looking at all of the historical shorelines, quote unquote, that people have looked at from Viking data from Mars Global Surveyor and, and actually putting this together in kind of like a summary and then analyzing it with the better data we have now from things like CTX and high rise to say, you know, okay, these areas that we thought were maybe shorelines, mostly from topographic information, or the idea that, well, we have all these giant outflow channels that are dumping into the northern plains from what we can see uh, that water needed to have gone somewhere. Do we actually see the evidence of those shorelines now that we have better data and more complete coverage at higher resolution? And that evidence still isn't really there. They found about like one location where there was something that could maybe be inter interpreted as some shoreline features. But other than that, the evidence was not strong. Um, they looked at different areas where people analyzed certain spots compared to other spots. And there were like hundreds of kilometer differences in terms of where they mapped a shoreline versus the place where they're doing the analysis. So it's really great to actually see this encapsulated in a single paper because I think mm -hmm. the sort of like folk knowledge in the Mars science community was, yeah, there's not really strong evidence for this ocean, even though we kind of talk about it like maybe it was there. This paper does a really good job of summarizing and then demonstrating as well, like the lack of the evidence for this ocean. So they were careful to point out, uh, especially in the Twitter thread, which I thought was great, just because we're not seeing the shorelines doesn't necessarily mean that the ocean was never there. Maybe there's just been geologic processes over the billions of years that have gone past since the ocean might have been there that have erased these things. Um, but it certainly doesn't 
lend much support to the idea that the ocean was ever there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Phil, like, so you, you can correct me here, but in this general area, uh, just thinking right. of things on the ground that may be where hypothetically said shorelines would be, uh, curiosity and perseverance, both in the vague vicinity of this, um, is, is, is that a, essentially, are there, are there landers or rovers that contribute to this? Oh, uh, well, I, I don't know that I would rely on landers very much for that. I mean, unless you sent a lander or a rover specifically to one of these, uh, shorelines, but, um, the existing landers and rovers are not in the right place. They're not going to tell us. Uh, so maybe what you could do is find what you thought was the absolute most compelling uh, evidence for a kind of uh, fossil shoreline, if you like, um, and then go there and look at it. Uh, but, you know, if it was, say, three billion years old, two and a half billion years old, something like that, an awful lot kind of happened to it uh, in terms of erosion or burial. Um, uh, so I it, I don't know. Uh how feasible it would be to to really uh, identify it, especially based on just topography. Uh, I would be much more concerned, I think, uh, with um, uh, the idea of looking for the um, uh, the chemical signs of that uh, uh, ocean. You know, in terms of sort of um, uh, uh, oxidized. Uh, minerals or hydrated uh, minerals or clays or whatever the things that you would expect to find on the bottom of an, uh, of an ocean uh, rather than trying to find geomorphological evidence of something uh, that happened two and a half billion three billion years ago excellent and tanya i just want to point to any one of the questions in the chat about you know i guess a couple of them kind of hinted where was <laughs> where is this water now I guess, and this is also something I know you've talked about, but I, short and simple, it either went up or down, arguably. Um, where, yeah, where is this water now if it was there three billion years ago? So we know that there's a really thick cryosphere on Mars, which is basically just a layer of ice beneath the surface. And so um, I believe we talked about this in last month or the month before Space Club, the idea that a lot of Mars's water is actually trapped in the crust of Mars. It wasn't lost to space like we thought, the paper from Bethany Elman's group at JPL. Um, so a lot of that water permeated into the soil the regolith and froze. Um, and some of it escaped into space over time when the magnetic field shut down uh, and Mars just started losing water essentially by sublimating away into space because it was no longer stable on the surface. So there's some of it that's still preserved there, but um, we don't necessarily have a great idea of like if that ocean was there based on the evidence that we have. So maybe it's the kind of thing where if we sent humans with the equipment to do drill cores, kind of like we do in Greenland, uh, you could actually start to get into this chemical analysis like Phil was mentioning. You're so anti-rover. You're always pushing big human. The rovers can do it. <laughs> rovers can do it just fine. The rovers Maybe. are good at giving us little pieces of evidence, but to answer a lot of these big questions about Mars, we're going to have to send humans and lots of big equipment to understand. <laughs> like if you sent a rover to Greenland, you wouldn't be able to do the type of analysis that we are capable of doing to le learn about, say, the climate history of Earth, as you could with these giant cores that we analyze where we can actually see the stratigraphy of Earth's climate, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Big, just a sh shield, a big human. Um, okay, so let's move on in the interest of time. And it's it's on to what we kind of promised or named the episode after, and that is all the things happening at Mars that aren't uh, NASA. Obviously, we just uh, talked about right. NASA quite a bit. But Phil, uh, take it away. Okay, well, so um, let's just uh, move into the next slide here. What I want to do is to look at these uh, multiple missions but let's first point out how many missions there are at Mars right now. Here are eight active orbiters. Uh, every one of those spacecraft is active in orbit around Mars right now. Um, so, and I'm not even including all the ones that are, have orbited in the past and are no longer active, like the Viking orbiters, um, Mariner 9, uh, Soviet orbiters, that sort of thing, uh, Mars Global Surveyor. So there are plenty that are not active, but eight actual spacecraft active in orbit. And go to the next slide. And all these things on the surface. It, now, I have to point out this image is not to scale, <laughs> but uh, 
yeah, if we if we count ingenuity there, we've got five separate spacecraft active on the surface right now. So there's a lot going on. And ingenuity actually, I think, just flew yesterday for its seventh flight. I don't know anything about uh, what happened, whether it was successful or not, but uh, it was supposed to fly uh, yesterday, I believe. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we should know in a couple of days. Uh, it takes a few days to get the images down. Um, OK, so now let's look through these. Here's uh, uh, the first of these. This is from India, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, uh, sent uh, the Mars Orbiter mission, uh, MOM, to, uh, to Mars. Uh, it arrived in 2014, so it's been there for quite a while. Uh, it's still functioning, I believe. Um, uh, it's uh, taking images. Um, it's in a, an elliptical orbit, so when it's up at the high end, it's the, di the distant end of its orbit, it can see the whole planet, and we get some nice images. And I think they're good for showing things like the distribution of clouds or frosts, uh, dust storms, that kind of thing. Uh, occasionally, they get a glimpse of the moons, very occasionally. Uh, so there's Phobos as well. Um, now, and let's go to the next slide there. So here's one of these uh, nice global images. Uh, when the spacecraft is down at the uh, lower part of its orbit, closer to the planet, it takes regional views, uh, which I, I don't have an illustration of here, but uh, um, I'm not really convinced uh, uh, with sort of how useful the, those regional views are. They're not as detailed as uh, the, the really detailed images we can get now from, from other spacecraft uh, that, uh, that tell us a lot. Uh, if you're just looking at a, a broad region, I, you're probably not learning a great deal except about the distribution of, of uh, uh, the albedo markings or something like that, which do, and they do change from time to time. Um, but uh, I really like the global views because you get this uh, great global uh, uh, idea of where there are clouds, where there are hazes, where there are dust storms. Uh, sometimes you're seeing the edge of the uh, frost cap, that sort of thing. Um, the spacecraft did have a, a sensor for methane in the atmosphere, which unfortunately wasn't sensitive enough to really give useful results. Uh, that, was, uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, so anyway, it's been taking pictures uh, and they are available. India has set up a kind of version of the PDS for its uh, images um, uh, and they are available there. Uh, and uh, um, now, oh, now we can move on to the next. Yeah, let's move on to the next mission here. Uh, Hope Al Amal uh, is from the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. Um, there increasingly interested in space and they're working on a lunar rover uh, mission right now it will fly in a couple of years uh, so they're getting busy um, uh, in space <coughs> and they're looking at, uh, at astronauts as well oh yes a, a, a lunar rover that may have things worked on by one dr matt cross it's just saying Ah, yes, indeed. That's right. In fact, there are, there are and not just Matt, but um, the mission control uh, team with uh, Melissa uh, yep, and other that's right. of no, our colleagues from Western. Yep. Uh, that's right. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so only anyway, UAE, the United Arab Emirates, are getting into space. And here they have this uh, orbiter. It's also in an elliptical orbit, um, but ma mainly focusing on, on uh, distant observations of Mars. Um, but again, the idea is to get uh, a good global view of the distribution of uh, things in the atmosphere um, and also measuring the temperature of the atmosphere. And I think they're looking at um, uh, uh, atoms escaping from the, at uh, the atmosphere into space and that sort of thing. We're just getting into that science phase and there isn't a huge amount of information out there about their results. But let's go on to the next slide uh, here. And... Uh, we see um, some of the uh, imaging they're doing. Uh, they have an ultraviolet uh, channel, uh, a red channel. You can combine them. Uh, in those images, you can see the North Polar uh, uh, cap, uh, uh, ice and, and frost up in the in the north. But there are also uh, hints of um, uh, uh, sort of clouds and hazes and other parts of the planet. They show up really nicely in the uh, ultraviolet there. In the red, you're not mainly looking at the surface. So when you put them together, you get a really nice uh, view of what's happening. And uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and there you have some temperature mapping. Uh, so the surface and uh, quite high up in the atmosphere. Um, uh, so they're, they're uh, mapping temperatures as well. And basically, you can look at that 
day by day as you go th uh, through the seasons uh, and you get a lot of information about what's happening in that atmosphere. It should be a good mission. It should be quite productive uh, and it's working away there. Uh, we're not hearing a great deal about it, but it's 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 up there and it's doing things. Now let's move on to the next one. And here we got uh, much more to say. This is uh, China's second Mars mission. Uh, their first one was um, unfortunate. Uh, it was flying with a, a Russian spacecraft. It was a little kind of piggyback payload. It would have been a small orbiter uh, and it was flying with a Russian uh, spacecraft. So it was like uh, piggybacking on the Russian spacecraft, but the Russian spacecraft never left Earth. It suffered a, a failure uh, uh, in Earth orbit before it left. So, so China lost that mission. Now they have one just on their own and it's working fine. So here we are. The image shows basically the big orbiter uh, with uh, strapped onto the top of it there um, uh, an entry capsule which contains uh, a lander and a rover. Uh, so uh, the orbiter was uh, put into orbit in February. Uh, it's been mapping the landing site uh, and uh, they have a really nice high resolution camera which I think has a pixel size of about two meters on the surface something like that. Now that's not, not as good as uh, uh, NASA's high-rise uh, camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I, I've been hearing people say, why don't they just use high-rise images? But there weren't any high-rise images of the, the actual site they went to, although there are some nearby. Uh, and I think people have been requesting more high-rise images in that area. Uh, but certainly when China uh, was planning for this and when they got there there was no high-rise coverage for the specific area they were going to so uh, they couldn't rely on that they had to use their own images here's a map that shows where they went so Tianwen-1 went to the uh, nearly the middle of that image uh, and we can see where that is relative to a bunch of other spacecraft uh, including the three current landers Perseverance, uh, Insight and Curiosity uh, Perseverance and Curiosity, the big rovers, and inside is a static lander with the seismometer. Um, and there's Tianwen One landing in the planes. We can see it's in the in the in the uh, the planes there. Um, uh, all of these things have gone to places that are quite low elevation, and that's really the common factor there. You want a low elevation so that your parachute uh, can work effectively. Uh, so that's where they've gone, and let's uh, move on again. That's just a Chinese map so showing uh, the area. You can see the big volcanoes of Elysium off to the right. Uh, and the uh, deeper blue color is lower elevation there. And uh, that's where the, the spacecraft has landed. And it was an area that was considered for Viking back in the 1970s, uh, but rejected. OK, so let's uh, go on. Got some orbital images uh, early in the mission, uh, quite nice, but you know, similar to things that we've seen from many other uh, missions like that. Uh, but it's when you get low down that you really get useful things. So let's go on. That's the most things. I've ever seen Mars look like Jupiter. Like this one especially <laughs> looks like those Juno images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah what's point, the guy's yeah. name who does the really good Juno images? I can't remember. Oh, but, Sean? Yeah, well, not Sean. Well, Sean does, uh, I was thinking of someone else. Yeah, but yeah, Sean's oh. images are in here later. Oh, right. but yeah, that's really Jupiter looking. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Okay, move on to the next one there. Um, okay, so this is just a map showing where they uh, intended to go. So based on analysis of uh, e existing information, uh, they had picked a target point, which you can see at the bottom center there, the initial target point, and they published the coordinates for that quite some time ago. Uh, so, um, Whenever you're choosing a landing site, you have to consider how accurately you're going to be able to aim. So people define a kind of elliptical area around the landing point uh, and say, you know, we're, we're maybe sort of 99% likely to land inside this ellipse. And then you have a smaller one and say, you know, we're sort of 50% likely to land inside that smaller ellipse, that sort of thing. Um, but when you put the ellipse uh, uh, around that target point, it includes a couple of craters there which show up with uh, bright markings around them, eject around them. Uh, so they had to move the, they, they wanted to move the ellipses to avoid those craters. And they, so they had one that is up a little bit higher and one off to the left a bit more. Uh, and uh, then they adjusted one of them slightly to again avoid a little bit of rough uh, terrain. So now you've got a landing ellipse uh, and they actually landed pretty much in the middle of that, uh, uh, that ellipse there, the final landing ellipse. So we can see where they are. Okay, let's move on there. 
well, I wanted to point out too, like I thought that was kind of maybe I just wasn't paying attention to Twitter that much that week or or the news, but like that was kind of buried as a story. Like only other well, not JPL to land successfully on Mars. Uh, right. And they nailed it too, right in the middle of their landing ellipse. Yeah. As much as I joke about the Soviets doing everything first, uh, this this was pretty big. Like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no one had, no one else had done this except for JPL. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so all right, let's move on there. So here we have an image showing the landing area. Now, this is interesting because we've got. Uh, <sighs> Well, you can see some little craters, but there are also some little hills. So the hills have shadow on the right-hand side. The craters are bright on the right-hand side and shaded on the left-hand side there. <coughs> so uh, the hills are thought to be little volcanic cones, and every one has a tiny little pit in the middle of it. So they do look like volcanic cones. It's not quite clear if they are sort of built up of, out of lava or ash uh, as a volcanic cone would be. We can find cones like that, for instance, on the slopes of the big volcanoes in Hawaii. So I'm not talking about these being like the big volcanoes that make up Hawaii, but on the slopes of those big volcanoes, you find little cones, little ash cones like that. Uh, th that's the kind of thing that they are. Um, but it, they might also possibly be so-called mud volcanoes, which are kind of... Uh, um, uh, erupting mud. Uh, there are things like this in various parts of the world. Uh, perhaps the most famous ones are in New Zealand and they, they sort of uh, erupt mud. And in a cold landscape like this, that warm mud from below might come up to the surface and bubble up and be thrown out of a little vent, but then it would start to freeze. And so it would build up uh, something that looks pretty much like uh, solidifying lava, but it would be solidifying mud. So it might be a mud volcano. It might be a uh, a lava or ash type volcano. We don't really know, but they do look like little volcanoes. And there are literally thousands and thousands of these little volcanoes. Uh, they landed about three kilometers or so away from one of them. Um, so maybe possibly they could get to it, but I think they'll be driving pretty slowly. Uh, so they might not last that long. Uh, the other thing you can see there is some fractures in the surface. I don't really know much about uh, about those yet. Uh, okay, so let's move on there. I wanted to add this is a oh, this yeah. picture is a perfect example of shadows telling you when something's a depression versus raised. Yeah, uh, which is like a trick I I know is not a planetary scientist, but like this is a crater because um, the sun angle is being blocked by the rim, I imagine. But then, uh, yeah, this this is a hill because the sun, which is over here, is hitting it, and then there's a shadow here. And like when you see these with, I guess like noon, sun, like to non-planetary scientists, they just look, they all look like craters or they all look like domes and it's like yeah. impossible to sort out. Um, and then I just wanted to, oh, and then Tanya answered that question in the chat about landing ellipses. So let's uh, okay. keep going. Okay, let's, uh, oh yeah, here we are. So here we have a close up, and this is actually from the Chinese orbiter. Um, uh, oh, yes. Uh, so those little white lines are sort of uh, sand dunes or dust drifts. Uh, they're, uh, they're just created by the wind blowing loose material around and piling them up in, in drifts like that. Over time, they would gradually migrate across the surface. <coughs> but that's, um, that's not a bad surface for a rover. There are craters, but there's lots of space between them. There are little uh, drifts of sand or dust, but lots of space between them. Uh, so you would be able to drive on that pretty well, I think. Okay, now let's uh, move over to the next one. And here we have a picture uh, taken after landing. It's sort of in the middle of that previous one. Uh, this is um, about maybe, uh, uh, or oh, uh, I, I I'm trying to remember now. It'd probably be about a thousand meters across this uh, this image, uh, and we can see the lander itself is up at the top, and we'll get a close up of that and talk about it in a minute. Uh, down below it is the parachute and and the back shell, uh, and at the lower left uh, is the heat shield. And we know that those things are are uh, are those objects and not just sort of let's say pre-existing boulders or something on the surface because they have a, an image taken before that doesn't show those things. 
Uh, so uh, we know they're new. Okay, let's uh, move on there. Here's a close-up of the lander. Um, and the rover, which is called Zhurong. Uh, and um, yeah, so those two little white dots, the, the slightly larger white dot at the top is the lander and the rover is the, is just below it. Now, as far as we can tell here, the rover came off on the right-hand side. So it drove down on the right-hand side and it's moved around. Um, uh, so uh, and now it, it, we see it below there. North is at the top in this image. So it came off on the east side. Now it's on the south side. It's not quite clear whether it just drove the short distance from east to south or whether it went the long way around the lander. Um, but where it's parked there, uh, it's able to photograph a flag on the lander. Uh, and we haven't got that picture yet, but we should have it shortly, I expect. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, no, th there is also this sort of funny pattern. Uh oh. Did we lose our. Oh, there we are. Okay, sorry, it appeared to disappear from my point of view. I don't know if it did for other people. Um, uh, there's a dark patch generally around the lander, and then there are a couple of white streaks. Um, and uh, the story that I've heard about these is that the dark patch uh, is um, is a place where dust has been blown away by the rocket exhaust during landing. And we see exactly the same thing, uh, for instance, uh, at the InSight landing site, which is surrounded by a dark spot. Um, the white streaks apparently are produced by uh, venting some uh, surplus fuel after landing to make the lander safe. Uh, so that it won't uh, explode. Um, uh, you don't want to leave residual fuel in the tanks uh, if you can avoid it. Um, and I'm not quite sure that I understand why that makes the surface bright, but it, uh, it has done. Anyway, uh, I'll probably get to learn more about that later. Uh, okay, so let's move on there. This is what the rover looked like in the lab. Um, the name Tianwen-1 uh, refers to the whole mission uh, and also is used for the orbiter. The rover is called Zhurong. Uh, there are a couple of different ways I've seen it written there. Uh, and it, it's, uh, in, it has several instruments, uh, but uh, the significant ones really, I think, are the, uh, the laser uh, for laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. In other words, basically measuring the composition of something. You fire a laser beam at it and look at the spectrum of a little flash of light that you see where it hits the surface, uh, and also a ground penetrating radar, uh, which uh, will uh, detect layers down below, including la layers of ice if there is any, but uh, you know, also layers of sediment, uh, whatever happens to be underneath. Uh, I don't know what depth. Uh, on the moon, they've used the, this uh, very effectively uh, and got data back from uh, several hundred meters depth. So we'll see what they do here. Uh, the lifetime of the mission is about 90 sols, but it could easily go longer. That 90 is just the, sort of the minimum that they want it to work. So here's some pictures. There the rover is sitting up on top of the lander. Uh, a ramp has been deployed for it to drive down, uh, and it's just about to set off and come down there. Uh, and you'll notice uh, if you go up to the top near the horizon on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, there are a couple of linear features, and those are the ground penetrating radar antennae, or two of them anyway. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, take the next one. And now it's down on the surface. We can see the shadows of the uh, radar antennae there. Uh, and a pretty flat horizon, as you can see. This is uh, the rover sitting on the lander again, uh, but this time looking in the other direction, looking out at the horizon. Uh, very flat horizon. There is a tiny bit of relief. Um, uh, it's barely visible in that view, but on the right-hand side, you might detect a very slight uh, mound on the very right-hand side of the horizon in that view, uh, which could be a crater rim or conceivably could be the nearest of those uh, little mud volcano type features. Uh, okay, and now let's take the next picture. Uh, and there they are now, uh, having driven off and on the surface. Now that's coming down on the uh, eastern side of the lander. And right now they are uh, on the southern side of the lander, which is over to the left. Uh, and uh, there's a little gray thing just hanging down from the lander deck just to the left of the ramp. And that's the Chinese flag. So they've moved around to photograph that. We haven't got that picture yet. Uh, there haven't been very many pictures released. Uh, so um, 
if uh, we, we we still could use a high resolution panorama and I'm sure we'll get one pretty soon uh, okay and I think that might be the last image oh no it's not quite there's a color image those were from hazard cameras mounted very low on the rover this is from the uh, navigation camera which is up on top of a mast um, uh, and uh, imaging the rover part of the rover deck um, <clears throat> The rover deck has four panels opened out from it, which is solar panels, um, and two of them, uh, all four of them folded out, but two of them can be lifted up and down, and the idea is that they can try to shake dust off if it accumulates on those. That's something that uh, NASA's solar-powered landers haven't been able to do, and right now uh, InSight is suffering because it's uh, so covered with dust. Uh, so hopefully this will uh, avoid it. It's also got a special coating, apparently, to reject the dust. Uh, okay, so that might be my last slide there. Let's see if it is. Yeah, it is. It yeah, okay, is. Uh, I apologize to everyone. We'll probably go about 10 to 15 over. If you have to leave, that's okay. But we thought we'd update very quickly. Uh, perseverance, uh, ingenuity, uh, and even insight, which Phil mentioned. And I'll, I'll run through these very quickly. Um, this is the most recent map by Phil of, of, <laughs> of movements. Uh, by Perseverance, it's moving around. It's tough to see uh, at this resolution, but um, uh, we'll talk about more specifically what it's been up to. Uh, this is just a pick from the end of April, actually, of, of Santa Cruz Hill, uh, which is to the south of the rover, Phil? No, no, it's to the northeast. North, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, and but more strikingly this is most of what, what perseverance has been up to at least uh from a from a major communications perspective uh so percy snapped this pick of Ginny, uh ingenuity the the helicopter uh with one of the nav cams on ingenuity's fifth flight and the fifth flight uh, last time we left we were talking about the 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 helicopter had essentially been going up and down and that was its entire mission it was it was a tech demo it was an experimental mission to see if you could fly a helicopter on mars and that all went so well uh, that they've advanced to moving ingenuity along with perseverance so so uh, we were all wrong or i was I, I mean not that i'm an expert on these things but i was wrong in my expectations of what this thing would be able to do uh, so ingenuity is following along so on this fifth flight it, it went up to its normal 10 meters of, of altitude, and then it moved southwest, uh, kind of in the general direction of Perseverance, uh, 129 meters. So um, it, it's making its way across the Martian surface slowly but surely. Um, I'll, I'll also say that, you know, we, we also mentioned, I think last month or the month before that uh, uh, Perseverance was testing out its arm, it was moving it, but now it's started to operationalize the instruments that are on the end of that arm. Uh, this is the Watson instrument, which is a camera uh, zooming in on a rock. Phil, I don't know if you have anything to add on this one. Um, well, uh, no, I don't know if I, I do. It's um, similar, but very uh, enhanced version uh, of the microscopic imager on Curiosity. Uh, and uh, it's going to give uh, really nice uh, results when you look, when you want to look at uh, you know very small features. So th this is just demonstrating this wide range of uh, imaging resolution that it can do. It's a good camera. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is an image from uh, Ingenuity on its sixth flight, looking down obviously at its own shadow, uh, but much more pretty from that same flight is this very cleaned up high high resolution image from Ingenuity, uh, which is just phenomenal. And uh, this was the sixth flight. And Phil, you mentioned that the seventh had already taken place, which I I think I, I think so. I haven't seen confirmation of it, but it was supposed to. Yeah. So um, I was looking yeah. at that before we went on as well, and I couldn't find anything either. Uh, it was there was discussion that would happen last night. Yeah, um, but there was a minor issue with it on its sixth flight. Something about the, the blades. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there was. Um, uh, I don't know all the details of it, but it sounds as if um, uh, as it's flying, it's taking the black and white images like the previous one, um, uh, and then uh, a, a computer chip on board compares. Uh, each picture with the one before it to try to estimate how it's moved uh, and it uses that for navigation and apparently they somehow skipped one of the images 
um, but didn't um, didn't skip the time counter. So uh, subsequent images uh, had the wrong time attached to them. Uh, so uh, there was there was a problem, but it it recovered. Um, it also had some sort of unevenness in its motion, but it, anyway, it recovered, it landed safely, and uh, evidently, I, I thought they might have to do another little test flight just up and down to make sure everything was working, but apparently not. Tanya, are you thinking what I'm thinking? A time uh, lapse in the memory bank of a computer? This sounds like a TNG episode. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some sort of a some sort of temporal anomaly hit Mars, and Data is the only one who remembers. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bonus points for anybody in the the comments that can name this episode. Oh, you're like uh, Matt. Whoa. I don't know if Matt's on. Um, so this isn't just another picture from Perseverance of Ingenuity, the helicopter resting after its sixth flight, uh, maybe yeah. thinking about what it had done wrong. Um, and then, yeah, as me and Phil were saying, there was plans for a seventh flight as early as last night. And I couldn't find anything on whether none of the official announcements had anything from last night. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. Uh, just a quick tweet from the Perseverance rover. So it celebrated 100 Martian days uh, recently and had accomplished all these things. Uh, Tanya, any of those stick out to you as a Mars nerd? The fact that it's already taken 75,000 pictures, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, like all of these stats, I'm actually really curious, no pun intended, to how this compares to Curiosity's first 100 sols on Mars. I mean, the fact that it's you know deployed the helicopter, it's successful, MOXIE has been operating properly, uh, you've recorded sound, which is something that we've never been able to really do on the surface of Mars before, unless you count some of the... Uh, you know, the vibrations that we recorded with InSight, which isn't exactly the same thing as actually recording stuff with a microphone, for example. Um, I, I feel like compared to all the previous missions, this is a really impressive first 100 sols on the surface. Yeah. Right, now, um, I might be wronging Perseverance here. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Uh, so I, I, I might not quite be right here, but um, certainly in the case of Curiosity, uh, you drive, you stop, you photograph your surroundings and then you transmit back uh, very rapidly uh, uh, a whole lot of little tiny thumbnail images uh, of the surface and then the people on the ground say okay we'll take those and those and those and we'll get them on the next pass uh, orbiter pass you know so that they, they they choose the ones that are the highest priority and get them on the next orbiter pass uh, so these little thumbnails could be counted as separate images uh, mm. And so sometimes when you look at the number of images, they're including thumbnails, which are basically reproduced later on with full size images. Uh, and sometimes the number isn't. And I, and, um, I think Perseverance is probably doing the same thing. And I'm just not quite sure whether that 75,000 really counts as uh, 75,000 uh, completely separate images or whether it includes uh, you know, nearly 50% of it as little thumbnails. Uh, That's a really good point. It's 75. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, to have downlinked 75,000 full frame images would be really impressive, like from a from a data rate standpoint. Right. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious too now. It's 75,000 uh, pixels. <laughs> pixels? <laughs> oh, yeah. we, we have an answer from Ooh. the audience too on the TNG episode. Oh, were they right? I don't, I wouldn't know. Uh, yes, I believe this is the correct title. So great job, Mark. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, these these like number of pictures taken always kind. Of, well, I mean, I don't follow. I don't work with the, the images as much as you guys do, so I wouldn't know. But like, I'm always kind of bewildered because like Cassini would say things like that too, like a hundred billion pictures and stuff. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> cool. Like I I've seen a few hundred. Um, but yeah, obviously. Um, yeah, I know. I, I don't think Cassini was doing the same thing with thumbnails. So, uh, okay. but I think what happened with Cassini is that they take a lot of images that look kind of fairly repetitive. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but what they're they're doing is, um, uh, you know, take, they're including pictures taken for navigation. They're including broad surveys of the ring system, uh, and uh, you know, this this sort of thing. So, quite a lot of the imaging looks 
uh, kind of redundant. So basically, when you look at the highlights of it, you see the special images, but there are an awful lot more uh, in the background uh, that are still useful, but uh, but they don't make prime time because they, they appear to be superficially to be uh, sort of redundant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or like really good Molly images from Curiosity. You'll have that that Z stack of images. Yeah, right. So you've you've fused like the max is eight images for a, a stack. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see it as like the pretty release, it looks like one image, but they've actually taken more to create that, or the yeah. selfies and things like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, picture nerds, you're starting to get technical. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> just going to move on. Um, so to Curiosity. <laughs> Um, this yeah, is an image done by there. <laughs> so me and Twitter or me and Tanya had an exchange on Twitter about this because Sean, I guess, has had people <laughs> claiming this has happened. I mean, Sean has all sorts of things happening with his imagery um, that he's constantly uh, complaining about, rightfully so. Um, yes, this has not happened, obviously. Uh, Tanya, you could flash up the artist's rendition if you want. Oh, it's but, on. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I can't see stuff. Um, but yeah, I've been racking my brain. We could never get this height, but is there any engineering or science reason to end a rover mission with a sweet jump? And I can't <laughs> think of one. Um, obviously like with orbiters, there's always, you get the information as you crash into the planet and that's great, but I can't think of anything. Um, so I'll keep working on it. Phil, any ideas? I think you could. We could repeat Galileo's experiment. You could drop a feather and a rover off a cliff. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could work. Um, I, I, I won't. This just this is just to show you. Curiosity still exists. Um, as Tanya was saying, it's the poor old ballet dancer that no one pays attention to anymore. Um, it reminds me of Winona Ryder's character from Black Swan, the one that's bitter because she's been replaced. Um, but no, Curiosity is still going. Apparently enjoying, uh, while everyone's paying attention to Perseverance, just watching clouds pass by. Um, Thinking about its own existence. Yeah, <laughs> just looking up and pondering. Uh, I, Phil, is there any major science activity you want to talk about Curiosity in 10 words well, or less? <laughs> I guess the most significant uh, stuff coming out of Curiosity would be the two recent drills, I suppose. Uh, they they drilled and analyzed samples uh, below um, the mountain that the rover was just jumping off there, uh, and then up on top of it. Uh, the results haven't been announced yet, but um, uh, I, I think that stuff is going to be the most significant. Uh, and of course, they're gradually moving uphill, and they'll be analyzing more sites. Um, but they're coming very close to this transition uh, mm. between the clay-rich Glen Torridon region uh, and the sulfate-rich uh, hills uh, just uh, just above. Uh, and somewhere in there is this really important uh, geological contact uh, uh, or uh, transition region. Uh, and that was one of the main goals of the mission, to see that uh, the environmental transition that is recorded in those rocks. Uh, so um, that's where the important science comes. The cloud pictures are also very pretty. <laughs> you should work for NASA comms. The cloud pictures are also very pretty. Uh, okay. Uh, Insight, just real quickly, Phil mentioned it. Uh, kind of an interesting thing. I think this is a, yeah. It's it's bathing itself in sand to try to clean itself. Uh, so the idea being that the wind will push the sand because the sand is, I guess, heavy enough. Uh, correct me there. But the, the idea is there's a bunch of dust on InSight that they need to get rid of. And if they dump the sand on it and the wind blows away the sand, it'll bring the dust with it. Did I get it right, Phil? Yeah, that's right. And oddly enough, <laughs> I was watching a hen do exactly this only a few hours ago. <laughs> really? Rolling, you yeah, hens? rolling around, giving itself a dust bath. Rolling, yeah, ro rolling around in the, in the dust, hmm. trying to give itself a dust bath. Uh, and I and I kept thinking, if only that would roll around on Insight, it was it could really clean off those panels. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So I think that's it for for our wrap up uh, or for for our run around of the solar system. Um, and then, as is now, I guess tradition for the third month in a row, uh, a little bit of a trivia slash random guessing game between Tanya and Phil. As you can see, there, yeah. Phil is the existing champion. 
Um, he he last month had requested that if Tanya lost, she got a chump medal, but I I didn't think that was that was oh. nice. <laughs> Bill would never do something so mean. Um, so um, the the idea of this month's game is that I'm going to name you a conspiracy theory. Uh, it, it won't, hopefully it hasn't been one that you've heard of because you guys are busy doing real science. Um, but what it is, is either something I made up or something I got from a video on YouTube that has more than a million views. Ooh. Ooh. So, but no, once you see them, it's, it's quite sad that these have more than a million views. So, um, Phil, as the reigning champ, you can choose to go first or second. Oh, well, I'll, I'll go second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to scope the questions. All right, Tanya, you ready? All right. Oh, well, I got to press the thing. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, real or fake, a large subsurface chunk of metal discovered at the south pole of the moon is proof that the moon is actually a weather control satellite built by our alien creators. Real conspiracy or something I made up? That feels like something you made up. That is real and what? from a video with more than a million views. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are going to have fun with this one. I was mad because last month you guys went nine for ten. So, um, okay. You can't necessarily conclude that those million people all agree with that. <laughs> no, no, but they've they've heard it. Ah, right. <laughs> all right. And now they're going to well, wonder. Exactly. They're not saying it's aliens. They're just asking questions. Um, <laughs> all right. Phil probably knows exactly what images is, but um, so I've recreated all the images so that you can't tell. So I've oh. went and grabbed some NASA imagery or whatnot and recreated it. So so they're all the same with my blue arrows there. Okay. Um, so there's no hints in the images. Uh, real or fake? NASA's LRO images show hundreds of instances of alien moon bases like this that have been bombed in a secret war between the UN and a secret alien civilization. Hmm. Ooh, tricky. Well, I think I'll say it's false. I, oh, no, wait a minute. Well, am I? Uh, okay. Um, Did I, you I'm make it up or is it from a YouTube? Make it up or not. Right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, it's I'm, I'm false. going to say I'm going to say that that is a, a, a real conspiracy off YouTube. I made that up. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it it might be now though. And if this video ever gets a million, hey, hey, all know. right. Okay, now that actually, of course, is one of the impact sites of a, a Saturn 4B upper stage on the moon. Yeah, Apollo 16. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm uh, curious, like, so there was at, at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference many years ago, I can't remember how long ago it was, somebody actually put up a poster saying that all the craters on Mars were from a thermonuclear war. Uh, uh, and those were like the explosion craters left behind. Uh, that was Phil's poster. <laughs> <laughs> It was not. <laughs> I, I, right. I had the poster about the quality of beer at the uh, at the, <laughs> the open night thing. <laughs> oh, oh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> all right. So you're both zero for one. Uh, all right. Real or fake? Miniature pyramids on Mars, imaged by Curiosity, were built by a race of tiny aliens. I ooh. Uh, well, after you made up the last one, I feel like. I feel like this one is made up. I I feel like I've heard a lot of the Mars conspiracies, and this is not one I've heard. You haven't heard enough. This is this was <laughs> on a video with more than a billion views. Oh, I guess I am no longer the professional Martian. I gotta put well, my name on the conspiracy <laughs> theories. All right. Oh, oh for three. All right. Oh, Phil gets another moon one. Um. All right. Real or fake? I made it up, or YouTube made it up? Uh, images of Lunar Orbiter 4 show large structures built in the middle of craters that cannot be natural because they cast a shadow. What? <laughs> Why can't something natural cast a shadow? Um, uh, okay, no, I'm, I'm going to say you made that up. Jeez, you guys. No, I did not. <laughs> this is <laughs> oh. real. And the, the gentleman's argument was that a uh, natural feature such as uh, what we know to be a central uplift uh, would not cast a shadow like that. What? 
I didn't look yeah. into it beyond his logic. <laughs> I mean, he was very specific too, like Lunar Orbiter 4. Why Lunar Orbiter 4? So like, this I is- I want to watch this video just to know what the heck- I'll send you, I can, well, I don't want to share yeah, it. Yeah, don't beyond. promote it. But I, I will send, I'll, no, I'll send it to you. I just don't want to put it in the chat or anything. Um, but this is a kind of a, a hallmark of these like downloading NASA images and then literally just putting an arrow on it. And that's like science. Like, look, I've done science. I'm pointing at yeah. things. That is um, science. Yeah. Well, the, the other, <laughs> I mean, to the be other fair, hallmark. I know geologists who also just put arrows on things, but they have reasons the other, to do The other that. hallmark of these conspiracies is that you take the most fantastic beautiful high resolution panorama of Mars or photo of the moon or something like that. And then you zoom in on some tiny little bit. It was only about five pixels across and you blow that up to the whole screen. So now it's very, very fuzzy. And then you say, so that's a building. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. So, so no one has scored yet. Okay. Speaking of, so that's a building. <laughs> um, Mars Curiosity raw images show a 3,000 foot hut that resembles NASA's VAB, Vehicle Assembly Building, uh, and houses the spacecraft Martians are building to come to Earth. 3,000 feet? These people don't know how tall the VAB is, apparently. The... <laughs> uh... I'm going to say this is real because I keep guessing it wrong. Uh... No, I made this up. Ah, damn it. <laughs> Uh, no, really. way the, off. Anyway, the, the VAB has a flat roof. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is obviously a yurt for Martians. But a Mars VAB has a pyramid on top, obviously. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, speaking of, of not knowing the numbers of things, the the video, so the one where I got the, the, the mineral deposit at the South Pole, um, they said that un, un, unlike what NASA says, it's not from a collision with the moon hundreds of billions of years ago. So oh. their, their, their grasp of numbers can vary. I mean, the universe isn't even hundreds of billions of years old. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so no one has scored. Ooh. Okay. Ah, this famous image. Yeah. <laughs> image. <laughs> Glorious. Uh, uh, so real or something I made up? Uh, magic eye technology was beamed back to Earth through Mars probes as a form of alien mind control. Phil, do you know what magic eye is? Well, I uh, know because I live on planet Earth. So, you know, those things you stare at and then you can see like a 3D image. Oh, image. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So that that's what this is. Ah. And it's gotcha. a form of mind control. Oh, well, I'm having a little trouble making that resolve into anything. So did I make this up or did someone on YouTube make this up and get a million views? Oh, well, I'll say, I'll say you made it up. I did. Look yes. at that. Yes. One point. <laughs> <laughs> I had to use this image. I just, mm -hmm. I was looking at it, trying to find like a lizard or like something. And then I realized it kind of looks like a magic eye. So I, <laughs> um, I wonder if kids oh. today even know what magic eyes are. Do they still I mean, make those? Phil didn't. And he's, he's hip with the kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> The grandkids, anyway. Yeah. Okay, Tanya, you're trailing. We only have you. You have two left. Phil has one left. Oh shit. Okay. Oh, I bleep that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I swear on this slide. Okay. Uh, Google Mars shows images of mass. Oh no, no, hold on. Curiosity imaged a giant crab-like creature hiding in the Martian rock face. This is the crab. This is a real one because someone actually sent me this picture on Twitter asking me to explain it to them. That's correct. <laughs> You've okay, tied it. I... Phil, were you aware of this one? Um, no, oddly enough, I wasn't. <laughs> but it does bear at the point that I, the point I was making before about you take the most beautiful picture yeah. and then you blow up a tiny corner of it and say that's a crab. <laughs> it's clearly a crab. Um, okay, so it's tied one one. Living on a planet with no water, no liquid water. Where is this crab surviving? Some oh, surface yeah. one. <laughs> um, I was wrong. Phil has two. Tanya has now. Tanya has one left. So oh. when I had said that, you both have two left. But now, so Tanya's tied it, but Phil has two left, and Tanya only has one. Oh. Yeah. All right, Phil. 
Google Mars shows images of massive herds of animals moving across the Martian surface. And I've put arrows pointing at uh, the, the herds of animals moving across the Martian yeah. plains. Yeah, look at the science I did. It's obviously yeah. the cows that are the source of the Martian methane. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I don't think you have the imagination, Danny, to make something like that. <laughs> I think that that's from YouTube. That is from YouTube. You yes. are correct. You are up two to one. Uh, yeah. So this one, uh, he he uh, he he compared this image to like yeah like antelope running across the Sahara or something, um, and and it looks nothing alike. But you know this is very clearly a herd of Martian uh, cows. I mean, also the size that those antelope would have to be to look that large in this imagery, because this is not a high-rise image. Uh, I mean, this would be like gargantuan antelopes. Scale. But everything's bigger on Mars, so. Scale, scale is not something that the conspiracy theory community is very concerned about. Do you remember? Oh, you wouldn't have been in that class. There, one of the classes that Oz taught at Western, there were like these zoom-ins of things with no scale, and you had to guess what it was. And oh, one God. of them, everybody guessed, was a crater, but it was actually someone's belly button. <laughs> Maybe because you presented it with no scale, you could yeah. really tell. So that was well, very then, clever. Yeah, well, you'd probably find a lot of that if you went through the videos I was watching. Uh, uh, I hope you got the proper ethics approval for that one. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, I think, uh, yeah, there's two left, fills up two to one, so uh, one each. All right, all right. Curiosity images of so-called pebbles are actually mini cannonballs left over from a planet-wide war between competing tiny alien races. Well, this is a big from opportunity, so they obviously got that wrong right off the bat. Right. Uh, I think you made this one up. I didn't make this one up. Damn it. <laughs> and it was on a very professional, uh, like top 10 website that has like multiple millions of followers. What? Um, they don't always do conspiracy content, but yeah, this, for all of the conspiracies in space topics they chose, they chose this one, which I had never heard. And is of course, even dumber than most that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I should have known because I think at least you would have known that this was not a curiosity image and you wouldn't have given it a different well, name. Well, I might have tried to throw you off, though. I'm more ah. I'm more imaginative than Phil gives me credit for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Phil, Phil, Phil has already run, but he can throw salt in the wound. Yeah. <laughs> he says it so nonchalantly. Yeah, of course I will. I take back uh, what I said about Phil being nice. <laughs> All right. Secret Soviet images of Venus show a network of bridges crossing oceans of lava on, on Venus. These are the, the bridges I've highlighted. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, um, okay. I, I'll go with YouTube. I made this one up. Oh, <sighs> It's, oh, here, and you prove the point about, you know, this is not a Soviet image, so you do do the swaps after. Ah, uh, ah, exactly. I was going to say secret communist imagery to add a little <laughs> a little oomph to it, but thought that might give it away. Um, yeah, I was like, honestly, you just pick any mar or picture of space, any object, and you just kind of, the first wild idea that comes to your head, and that, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, so Phil wins again. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> oh, wow. Some, well, some trophies in the mail. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, good. So thanks to everyone. Let me just uh, close my notes here. Did my mouse die? Oh. Good timing then. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> it's gone. I can't. Oh, oh my computer's like frozen. Oh, well, we can still we see go. and hear you. No, I'm good. All right. Is there still... Oh, my, my mom likes the quiz part. Um, <laughs> you cover things up with arrow. That's what they want you to think, Robbie. Um, all right. All right. So uh, thank you to everyone who stayed with us. This was like a 90-minute episode, a special episode. Uh, we'll be back next month-ish, July. So we'll probably do something Apollo-y. Not that Phil hasn't talked about Apollo enough in his life, nor have mm. Tanya and I, speaking of which, if you want to read about Apollo... Oh, you finally have it behind you. Hey, for all, 
Yeah, we have hundreds of viewers. You were on Al Jazeera with millions of viewers, and you don't even have it. I I made a mistake. I I'll fix that the next time they call me. You know. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining. It means a lot. We really enjoy your questions in there. Uh, I, all in good fun with the conspiracy stuff. Uh, obviously, none of us are into that, but uh, no, no harm intended there with our jokes. Uh, just having a good time. So uh, thanks for joining, everyone. Thanks for contributing. Share the word on Twitter and Facebook if you're old and still on Facebook like me and Tanya. Um, and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye, everybody. Bye.